Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Cerulean Arts Gallery. We're happy to present uh, In the Woods, a watercolor exhibition by Richard Estelle. And tonight is his uh, artist talk. Um, the exhibit is up through November 21st. If you're in the neighborhood, you can come and see it. And you can also see everything on our website. So I'll put a link to the show in the chat for you. You can see everything there. So um, Richard, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> well, that was my first thing of interest was watercolor, really, when I was a kid. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. And I painted mostly on site on my parents' property. So <coughs> I, I discovered um, it was a lot cheaper than oil paint. and. Um, it was easier um, in terms of cleanup for mom and my clothes and uh, not having staining things and stuff like that. So I enjoyed it. Then I discovered, you know, people like Andrew Wyeth and Charles Birchfield who had lived up the road. And um, then when I went to art school, um, I had actual training in watercolor for one year at the Cleveland Institute of, Institute of Art and they beat it out of me. I was um, no longer supposed to do observational painting or anything like that. In the, in the 70s, it was a real struggle. Those of you who remember the 70s, raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> remember? Yes, I used to remember them. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was it, it was a real struggle at a provincial art school to be able to do anything that was in any way representational because you were either supposed <laughs> to be second I can't hear you. You're you're breaking up. Oh, that might happen. We, breaking oh, up is hard to do. Can you, can you hear me now? <laughs> Yeah. We were either supposed to be painting uh, second rate sort of abstract expressionist stuff or um, uh, pattern painting, which was big for like five minutes in the 70s, or, or optical art, which one of our um, uh, teachers at the school, Julian Stanchak, had been a founder of. Huh. And um, Julian just painted stripes. And what he would say was, no one cares about your life. <laughs> because it's a horrible life. And I understood that later. But so it was a, a struggle in art school to paint uh, anything representational, even in Cleveland. You know, we would wait for art news to show up in the library. Ooh, if you remember those days. Hi, Allison. And uh, art news would come from New York City, and then we would we would go worship art news and art forum, and uh, try and imitate that stuff that we saw in there. And then, <clears throat> well, I was painting oil paintings and uh, trying not to be representational. Well, it didn't work. To make a long story short, I, I met some other people like Philip Gustin and Del Close from Chicago's Second City, who told me it was okay to tell stories, you know? And so I just kept going in that direction. Now with watercolor, uh, I didn't start it again till we moved here in 93. And uh, then I got seriously involved in it again because I'd gotten through the whole oil painting phase. I mean, I like oil paint, but it, somehow this just works better for me. I don't know. It's, it's more portable and it's, um, it's, I understand the medium better, I think, you know. Um, I'll leave that to you to be the judge whether, whether I actually understand it. 
But um, at this stage of the game, I, you know, I've had 50 years under my belt on and off. And it's never any easier. Uh, it actually gets harder. Uh, but what you learn how to do is edit better, I think. And when you, when you edit better, it also saves you time in terms of how many versions you have to do of one painting. Most of these have two or three different versions behind them, which is the, the dirty secret of watercolor painting. Um, I think Winslow Homer definitely kept it a secret because his paintings are so abstractly constructed. Many of them, I don't think, could have been done on site. And he always had his brownie camera with him. <laughs> later in life on every fishing trip every all that stuff so <clears throat> it's a it's a funny medium to work with in that way because the more mistakes you make in it it's sort of like the more you learn how to cover them up and then you you and the more paintings you learn how to sort of rip up and throw away so for every one, there's three in back of it, probably. And then you never tell anyone that. That's what like you're not, just, you're not supposed to do that. That's, <laughs> that's bad. Um, and they're not spontaneous at all in the least. Um, the thing about them <laughs> is they're extraordinarily planned, but when you work with watercolor, what you have to do is worry about the, the sequence of how the paint goes on the page, right? Because it's from light to dark, unless you decide to go from dark to light, which I do. But then you have to sort of um, figure out how overlapping colors are going to affect with one another, you know, what the end result will be. Yeah, this one's from Ithaca when we lived up there at Cornell. Hail Cornell. <laughs> uh, this was kind of in our backyard for a couple years. And this was a, uh, we had a gigantic storm there that turned the whole thing like piss yellow. Uh, these giant slogs of ice that were hanging on it and they, lasted till probably May. So it was just an extraordinary thing to have in your backyard. So I painted that when we moved here pretty much from memory, except for like a little snapshot I had of it. But it got the, it got the impression, I think, of Ithaca Falls. And then there, there was a big oil painting later that has that in it. Questions? Uh, not yet. Yes. Yeah, actually, Richard, I have a, qu I have a question. Yes. Um, why is it that um, that watercolorists keep secret the fact that they have found. that they have done in effect studies, which you know oil painters aren't aren't ashamed to admit that they have done a study as they work towards their oil painting. <laughs> Why should a why should a water have to have that? If you could please repeat your entire question, our speakers go out occasionally. Why should a watercolorist have to hide the fact that he or she has done studies when an oil painter doesn't? It's just one of those little secrets that mystify. Um, well what mythologized sort of watercolor in books and things like that and instructional manuals. No one tells you you're going to fail a tremendous amount of times. Like you're gonna fail like eight out of 10 when you first start, maybe nine out of 10. And, and simple things like the paper you use. You, you have to use really good paper, top of the line paper. If you don't, you're wasting your time. I used to have students who would come in when I was teaching this at the academy and 
they would show up with like four hundred dollars worth of brushes and paint, and then it would have a forty cent piece of paper. So I would bring little sample pieces of really good paper and show them that. So there's there's a lot of um, I don't know mythologizing about watercolor, which really it's just another medium. You know, the the best people in America that have worked on it. A lot of them were primarily oil painters. And they used watercolor because it was an expedient way for you to get ideas out quickly. You know what I mean? But yes, nobody ever talks about the failure rate. It's something that doesn't come up in literature. Because <laughs> you destroy those. I'm sure there were hundreds of homers burnt. And... Sergeant, he could pretty much paint what he wanted because he painted objects, things, you know. Um, he could just go out and paint a thing. It would come out perfectly. But lots of other people um, were not like that. So that's it, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> so but wait, let me see if I understand that then. It's it's the mythology that... that uh, prevent you from just admitting that, yeah, this took me about as long as it would take to do an oil painting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. People want to make it into something that it's, that it's not, that it's spontaneous and easy, which for me, it's the farthest thing from being either spontaneous or... <laughs> Richard, I have a question about another Richard. Uh, when I look at these paintings you're doing now, um, I often think of Richard Powers' novel called The Overstory, because you seem to be up to the same game in many ways, just kind of drawing out the life and the inter, uh, interconnectedness of uh, living things uh, out in the woods and, and dying things, for that matter, all part of the same uh, systematic uh, uh, being in the world. Uh, do, you, do you know the book? No, I don't, but apparently I'm going to have to read that now. <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Pulitzer yeah. Prize winning. He, okay. Well, yeah, he's a close friend. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I will. I I will read that. Richard Powers. Our other famous Richard friend. Yeah, our two famous, famous Richards. Richards. Yeah. Okay. Well, this this painting here, it's a funny painting because it just started out as a as a riff on a piece of anatomy. It looked like a giant leg to me, you know. Ouch. And I, well, so rest and leg, a giant, a giant, giant's leg, just kind of laying in the woods as though the giant had fallen apart. And that was what was left of it. So this one had a couple of little smaller studies in back of it, but I had to torture my way through this version. Um, this, this was the first run on this one. So that's, that's a rare one that it's, the first time that I got it. And it's done, you know, I take photographs, I do drawings, but the thing is you go back again and again and again to the same spot. I think that comes from my upbringing where I grew up painting in the woods, painting the same stuff over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So that branch, would it look more or less like a leg than what you painted? Oh, it looked just like that. <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time to, to catch that. It was this leg covered with fungus, you know, a giant weird leg covered with fungus. Now, Richard, that leg looks a little like Philip Guston might have drawn it. Yes, yes. Are you aware when you're doing these things of of these kind of echoes and similarities or does it just happen? Uh, no, absolutely. I, I, you know, I got to spend kind of a weekend with him and uh, nobody else was around. And I went to the Art Institute of Chicago with him. And that's was a, a wonderful experience. And yeah, I think about these things every day when I'm painting. And yeah, there's there's some all these people rattling around, I guess, you know, in there. And he he told me some uh, really valuable sort of interesting things 
The, the first one is never read art magazines again, <laughs> which, which I have faithfully not done for, for many years, like 40 some years. I've never picked one up and read an article, I don't think. And the second thing he said was, almost everybody in the art business is a fraud. <laughs> All the everyone's a fraud. All the critics are frauds. You know, there's uh, um, almost everyone. Almost everyone is a fraud, <laughs> except for him and um, Jackson Pollock, who went to high school together. You know, they weren't frauds. But yeah, I I don't mean to name drop, but I do because these people I think about constantly still. You know. And they change, they just change your life. You meet one of those people. I mean, you know, the same way when we had Archie Ammons up there at, at Cornell, it changed your life, Blake. I know that. Richard, would you like us to zero in on any specific painting? Oh, no, not, not particularly. Well, you could go to the, the one on the left there. Um, the log. The log. Here's one that I didn't have to do anything to. Like a giant crocodile. Yeah, it's just every <laughs> once in a while you get a freebie, one of these um, subjects that's so loaded that you don't have to do anything to it. Otherwise, I change them around a lot uh, most of the time. But this one just simply is a giant screaming log. Uh, you don't do very often. But when you do, it's it's kind of a nice thing. You can you consider that just a, a given, you know, and then just go home and paint it. So are you doing any painting outside? Not right now. No, I, I do. I mostly do drawing outside. If I, I go into the woods and draw something. And you make color notes on it? Yes, I do on the watercolors themselves on the paper. Just like my heroes, Edward Hopper and Charles Birchfield did where you just make little notes of what color it is. And then I have photographs and I have I, all kind of, yeah, memory is a big one. You know, I gotta go buy that log 15, 20 times before I figure out what to do with it. It, it, must, it must change over the course of that's what you're spending on it as well. That's the great thing about the woods is it changes constantly, you know. And you can go in one day and maybe you the thing's not there anymore. It's it's been destroyed by wind or 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 something like that or eaten up. <laughs> but you can watch things deteriorate. I, you know, it's morbid, but it's life, isn't it? So, Richard, you said you have to hit a subject several times. Maybe you blow a few paintings. Like, what point do you decide the painting is too far gone to do anything with? Um, well, I've been working on one subject that I've done. It's this these fallen trees right here from the back angle. And I just can't get it. I did four versions of it this spring. And it, it just still, yeah, these two big ones. And it just still doesn't, doesn't do it for me. So as long as I can stomach <laughs> starting it over again, uh, I will do that. Yeah. And there's lots of, lots of weather conditions. Like if you look at these two are of the same thing, right? But they're done in very different weather conditions. So the one on the left is done on an extremely hot, humid day. I mean, that's what I was trying to get, um, where the, the air was just completely still. And the one on the right is the same thing from a slightly different angle done in the springtime. So it's got a, um, a lot more, I guess, movement to it and there was wind in the air and 
all that. The air was clearer. So. Do you take your paintings back out when in the, in the middle of working on them to, to compare them to what you what you what you're painting? No, no, I don't, I don't really do that. I just go back and look at it again. You know, and just keep looking and looking and looking. I mean, it it, it seems to me, you know, the these things are a lot about drawing um, and just when you're working with watercolor this way it's about establishing boundaries for things that you're working on each boundary each line you make is a boundary for a color a lot of times and so it's about getting the right kind of um, rhythm to the drawing that makes the thing kind of come alive a bit and then making color notes and then going back inside and manipulating it however I have to, to make it seem as though it's the experience I felt at like one time. You start from the center and work out or? I do a, a lot because uh, the, <laughs> the center, uh, I have some kind of obsession about that. There's a lot of things in the center. You're not really supposed to do that, Richard. <laughs> but people have written whole books on that. You know, The Power of the Center. Anthony, you know that book? Mm, I'm not sure. Mm. No. All right. You fail, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> I know some other books. <laughs> no, uh, and things tend to revolve around the center in these in these sort of paintings that I do. It gives them some sort of sense of activity, I think, that I would not otherwise have. So it's funny you mentioned that, Richard, because that's like a secret. Uh, they sort of pinwheel off the center, a lot of them do. Sometimes it's so obvious that anyone can see it at other times. It's, it's hidden fairly well, I hope, but that's, you know, yes, you've discovered my hidden, my hidden center. Yeah. It sounds kind of, a, kind of Eastern. Yes, it, it, it yeah. is, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, a, you know, how people have attractions to vertical compositions or horizontal or, or squares, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, but uh, things rotate. This one on the left here with the log covered with um, fungus. It rotates off the center, right? Yeah, the center is empty in this case and everything else kind of swirls around it. So it gives it, I think, some sort of energy that it wouldn't have otherwise. I've used this composition a number of times and uh, it always it always works pretty good. And, you know, and then there's lots of metaphors as well for the log with the fungus. It always reminds me of uh, like planets revolving around a sun or something like that. They're, uh, <clears throat> here it comes. They're, ah! They're, uh, they're, they're sort of meta compositions. Fungal night. <laughs> they're, they're kind of meta compositions. They're, they're more about like bigger things, I guess. A lot of them are like that. It's not just a log with fungus on it. Get it? <laughs> Could I ask about speaking of that? Yeah. The, the painting to the right of this. Here, go, here goes Tina. Yeah, that's, this is a, um, a, a mashup of two different trees from two different places. Um, it, 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 looks like, it looks like an encounter. It, it looks like something from Ovid. You know, it's just, but I can't figure out what the figures are. But it looks like two figures encountering each other in the forest. Well, it's definitely a narrative, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, I'm asking, is there more of a story to it than just the sense of a story? Yeah, kind of. Um, but if I would tell you that, it would ruin the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, that would be, yeah. No, no, the, 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 
the tree on the right was the base of another painting that I did in remembrance of my father. Oh. Uh, that was a big dead tree with, it looked exactly like that. It had two great big eyeballs in it. Um, and then I combined it with this other tree in the foreground, which they were both in different locations, but I wanted to have the tree in the background looking at the one in the foreground. And who knows what the one in the foreground is? Maybe it's mom. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, at, well, anytime you put two things in a painting, you automatically have a nerd. You know, you, you can't avoid it. You can put two dots on a page and they're talking to each other. Two lines on a page and they're talking to each other, right? You know, you know that. I mean, you've drawn your whole life. Um, you don't have to work much to find a narrative in, in anything that you do. But going back to my art school days when they told me not to tell stories, you know, I try and tell them more subtly now, I guess. This one on the right here, this one looks like a bunch of fingers, doesn't it? This one in the center. With the green. With the green. It looked like a, it looked like a big gnarly skeleton hand to me. It's, it's just some tree branches over a little brook in the woods. But it, it had some, and I walked there a lot, it just had some deeper resonance, I guess, as being something that was, you know, I always like to look for menace out there. It's the hand of death. Yeah, the hand of death. That would be it, I guess, you know, but in a nice way. <laughs> do, you, do you have any paintings uh, that you would like to stick a person into? You know, I used to do that. Own oh, no, paintings, yeah. No, no, but in this group here. Oh, yeah. No, no. I, you know, for for a long time, I was doing narrative paintings with people, groups of people, and after a while, they just seemed ineffective to me, especially when you live in a city like Philadelphia, because we have some great narrative figure painting artists here. You know, they would they would be people you, you may or may not know, Pat and Richard and, and Blake, but people who came from here like Vincent DiCiderio and, and Bo Bartlett and uh, there's Randall Exon. I mean, uh, it, it, the, the list goes on. Philadelphia has a huge tradition of um, figurative painters and doing large narratives. So when I moved here, it's like, eh, I'm just another, another one on the list. Um, plus, I ran out of room to put these paintings, um, unlike some other friends of ours who apparently have an unlimited storage space. I, I do not. So what I'm, what I'm trying to do is offload some of those uh, narrative paintings, like for free. To, do some pull. We may be able to see uh -huh. if we can do that. Okay. It'll come back. Battery. Not yet. Not yet. No. Can you hear now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so anyways, Philadelphia had such a long history of that stuff. It was like when we moved here, it's like, geez, I better get in line, you know. So I just switched to what was more natural for me, I think, when we got here. If you look on... Uh, so to go back to Blake's uh, interest in the of, of a painting <laughs> of the two people who have been turned into trees, one is your father. Who's the other? He said it might be his mom. Might be mom. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> she is, you know, producing fungus um, <laughs> on this the tree. I no, I mean, uh, 
<laughs> hey, maybe it's Virgil leading your father through the underworld. I like that. That's better, I think. <laughs> it is. You know, there's a lot of hostility comes out in the woods. <laughs> it it uh, well, those trees are being real friendly to each other, actually. Thanks. So. Oh, there's a lot going on there that um, I recognize, but I only recognize it a long time later, usually. And people smarter than I point things out to me. <laughs> but uh, um, I guess that's the way it is with everybody who paints these sort of subjects that are, uh, I don't know, to, they're very amorphous, the woods, you know, since they change all the time and everything, it's, who knows what it, they mean? I mean, but uh, I know when they do mean something to me, then I stop. And I know if they're not working, then I stop. But, and I can start it four or five times until I get it. And I know I've got it, but I, I don't exactly know what I've got, you know? But isn't that why you paint? Because if you could write it, you wouldn't have to paint it, and it would be in words. Right. Right. Words aren't all that clear either. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, don't I know it? <laughs> after after knowing that you other guys, this this crowd from Cornell here, they are master wordsmiths who uh, I hung out with for many years. As graduate student and uh, over the years they've still maintained friendships with me Pat and Blake and Richard and uh, when I went to Cornell from art school I went there for graduate school I had been surrounded by people at Cleveland and the Art Institute of Chicago people who just wanted to make things and make things and make things at this this furious rate without thinking that much about them so when I got to Cornell, I met all these smart folks that understood words and um, deeper meanings and things. And they've, these guys have, have uh, definitely changed my life knowing them for so many years. And uh, I can't thank them uh, mm. because if like you've just gone to graduate school at another fine arts school, I would have missed so many things and such deeper meanings in in life and uh including camille <laughs> that's right <laughs> there too and there there ends the cornell commercial but, <laughs> yeah but a disclaimer i'm i'm i was not at cornell during this golden age he didn't go to cornell except it wasn't cornell university he went to cornell college in iowa <laughs> well you might have been Richard. So, so Richard, with my, with my octogenarian ears, I misheard you something, uh, say something a moment ago. You were talking about when you stopped, uh, something happens and then you stop. And I thought you said something happened and then I sob. Uh, and it made <laughs> no. me wonder what, what sort of, what, do you associate these paintings with, with a range of emotions? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Abs absolutely. Because they do make you... Um, want to kill yourself <laughs> you know it's it's a uh, well you can only you can only paint these things you can only paint these things for so long without saying like oh my god what am i doing you know it's um uh, is this a completely futile gesture <laughs> which of course it is but then you just have to see. I learned this from you, smart people at Cornell. Of course it is, but you just keep going in that general direction because, in the end, it's the end. So you have to, as our friend from Cornell, Atul Ray, used to say. You guys know him. Some of you don't. Um, you have to think of a way to keep yourself occupied until you die. <laughs> which is one of the, one of the best things he ever said to me I think and and you know this is good enough it's 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 
it's I mean I'm sure writing takes much more time. This is this is I would I would say this is more than good enough. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is better than most. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but I do like that you said that you have to keep doing it. It's like we in the English call it we say the insistence of the letter, and you're talking about the insistence of the paintbrush. I really like this a lot. Yes, and in art school, what the teachers would call us, and the, we saw that as a great compliment, was one of them would just look at you and elbow the other teacher and say, like, he's a lifer. He's not, he's not quitting, you know. He's just going to do this till he drops. <laughs> so it's a... Well, I wouldn't be alive, I don't think, if I wasn't doing it. You know, definitely. Because I would be, I, I would have been working in some steel mill or something and probably have gotten inadvertently, <clears throat> you know, injured. Because <laughs> I, I really didn't have any options. Richard, another love of yours, um, which astounds me, uh, is music. I'm not I'm astounding that you love music, but that you know so much about it and feel it so deeply. And I know from something you said just a while back that you listen to music while you're painting. Often. Oh, all the time, yeah. Uh, can you just talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, it really uh, makes it happen. I mean, you, <clears throat> which is why when when I have taught for years. I always encourage kids to listen to music. I mean, you're not supposed to in a lot of places where you teach, but for me, it just gives you an internal rhythm to work with. And then the, the subject matter of the music creeps in there too, I guess, if I'm listening to a, a completely depressing like Delta blues song, I'm, I'm sure that gets in there somehow, don't you think? Yeah, and, and happy things. But yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely on. I mean, I'm I'm obsessed with it like you are, Richard. <laughs> so, and you're on Spotify now. I am. I am. Isn't it fun? Uh, well, I, I got to tell you, they're a little bit short on um, <clears throat> Milton Brown and the Brownies. <laughs> uh, that's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> He loves it, in other words. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, it's great. It's a great thing. I, I can't listen to it enough to make them happy, it turns out. They keep writing me. <laughs> oh, yeah. They keep Maybe making not. more playlists, more playlists, more playlists. Yeah. But, yes, music um, has played a huge part in, in what I do. And I, I'm often sitting there with a a harmonica while I'm looking at paintings. That's what I wondered. I mean, yeah. And just, you know, going up and down the scale or things like that. Um, I, I don't know how they connect exactly, but they do. You know, I couldn't do it without playing music, I don't think. Hmm. It's very hard for me to sit there and look at a blank piece of paper without picking up a heart, you know? But it really, when these, I'm, I'm seeing in a picture, but the sense of scale, this thing could be 18 feet tall and you can't get your arms around it mm -hmm. or something you would see on the parkway, you know, so it's always intriguing to try to figure out uh, what it is and to see some of the, the ones with the blue sky and some where you don't see the sky, the darkness of overcast. Yeah. It's sunny, but you get in these, these canopy of, uh, of leaves. It's really interesting to see. Yeah, these pockets. Of yeah. The, the woods have, a, especially around here uh, in the Wissahickon, there's a lot of weird pockets of space because the the hills undulate, mm -hmm. uh, you know, above the above the creek on either side. And you know, you can be sitting in the sun, and then two seconds later, you're down over the hill, and the tangle of uh, the underbrush is really of great interest to me. You know. I mean, uh, what do the, the French call it? Sous-bois sous painting. The, the undergrowth, right? 
It was actually a category, French painting. Huh. Yes, I think it was listed fourth. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, you, you had figure painting, you had landscape painting, you had still life, you had, yes, genre painting. Maybe it was fifth or sixth, but um, Soubois painting of um, shit in the woods that was small and in undergrowth was an actual category in France. <laughs> I guess that's, that's what I've ended up with so far here. Yeah. Do you, do you do you paint clearings when the trees open up and the sky comes in and there's a little bit of sun? Sometimes, but that's a little tricky. You know, this one, uh, the one, the show card there, um, <laughs> toward the right there. Here, here we go. Yes, that's that's a, that's that's a little bit of an opening um, in the woods. That's on a path. But two trees had crashed into one another in, in this particular thing. And from the side, it was extremely dramatic. There was a giant diagonal where the one tree was leaning on the, the tree in the foreground, which it had, you know, pretty much killed. And I went back the other day, and the diagonal's gone. The tree, it, you know, that's... And so I was down there looking for it. I, I couldn't find it. Yeah. Fascinating. You know. So that's another subject. Now maybe I can do that from the back angle with that tree laying down. But yeah, I guess, you know, going, going back to art school again with, with Julian Stanchik, he would say things to me like, you can't paint. <laughs> You're not even a person yet. <laughs> you know that from the academy tradition of teaching, like these martinets. Well, Julian, Julian was definitely one of those guys. Uh -huh. And then one day I was painting a picture of a cat on top of a chair. And he said, ah, you have painted the primordial kitty. <laughs> 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 like he was into it he he thought i'd done something good and i couldn't understand what this was but i had just told a story and he he seemed to dig it you know um, but yes that's the only compliment he ever gave me do you know the names of these trees not i mean not the species phyla or whatever. oh no i don't care about this yeah because that when they do your when they, somebody writes about you, they're going to come up with this. Like I only did oak trees, and it was always green, and and then the bushes were all the same. It's definitely East Coast, up, Upper East, Mid Atlantic, or you know. I, I won't hold my breath. That far, but yeah, I was never interested in landscape, and I'm still not. Mm -hmm. so, um, I was I was always interested just trying to get something emotional out of what I saw and to do it to the best of my ability. And I was just attracted, I guess, to because what was around me when I was a kid, trees, a lot of trees. So it, would, it seemed like, you know, you can get anything you want from from. Anything, I think, if you try hard enough, any kind of subject matter. I, I hate to harp on him, but uh, Charles Birchfield, who I grew up like eight miles from where he grew up, and then I discovered his work when I was a kid. And the extremely boring place where I grew up, he got so much out of the landscape. It was just, and the conditions of the weather, and the emotion that he got in his work was just stunning. Mm. And even when I went to art school, I think the first big monograph came out of, about him in uh, 76. And a buddy of mine bought it for me. And even though he had grown up eight miles from me, I, I didn't know that much about him. But, I mean, he was such a, 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 a he wanted to be a naturalist first, you know. But he saw everything in terms of uh, 
nature, you know. And uh, yeah, it was it, it was in, in like he was really into the what do they call you you people who uh, have books there Emerson people like that transcendental. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> See, this is why it's good to know smart people, Mike. Uh, who was it? the American for romantic? Yes, transit. He was. He was very much on the transcendentalist side. Yeah. Who Who wrote the book? Do you remember the the name? That Matthew Bagel. Bagel. Uh, yes, I still you, have it. You use. I guess you're using good sable brushes. No. Right. I <laughs> I went landscape painting and took all my Series 7 Windsor Newton. It was fun. Yeah. I worked with Magna, which cleans up with acetone. So I, I thought I yeah. killed everything there. But I kind of put it back on the shelf. And about two weeks later, all the hairs were eaten out of them. Actually, I use, I'm lying. I used two or three good Kalinsky sables. That yeah, I that, the Series 7, yeah. The, the, yes, these are about 20 years old and they look like I bought them yesterday. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's more about the absorption in your paper. Well, I, I use Fabriano pretty oh. much. That's all I use. But they have recently, I bought a, a bunch of paper from them and their sizing has changed. Then I found out what it was. They're using vegan sizing, instead, which is a wonderful instead, idea. Instead of rabbits. But instead of causing poor rabbits to be squeezed to death, but they, uh, it doesn't work as well. You get dead spots in the paper. Okay, Richard, this is really quite wonderful. Um, and, um, I'm gonna leave you. Yes, on that note, I guess we'll end here. Oh, that's because we're leaving. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Bye, Thank you. Bye. It was great to hear you here to talk, Richard. This was great. So much all all of you for for ending it was so nice to see you all all right yeah, all right there he is <laughs> you later oh, bye, bye. 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 bye bye everybody thank you bye. thank you